Welcome, Ben Mama. Video game history is a huge interest point these days. You can't move for videos on the subject, in fact. Indeed, my own channel is heavily supported by my story or videos that look at some of the lesser-known tales from the past. A common spin-off from these many stories is the what-if element that speculates on alternative versions of events and how it would have changed video game history. One of the most interesting aspects of these theories, in my opinion, is the systems that nearly made it out with a different badge on them. In this video I'll be looking at five such examples within the console sector. These are all systems that we know and love and very much associate with their respective brands. But it was nearly a very different story, as the original plans saw them belong to a rival of the company that eventually released them. There's certainly a great deal to consider and speculate on here, so let's get those theories running shall we and look at some alternative timelines. So let's start off with a well known one shall we? I think most of us who follow the retro gaming scene are more than aware of the story behind the legend that is the original Sony Playstation, aka the SNES CD. I don't want to go into too much detail on this one for several reasons. Firstly because I think most people know what it's all about, but also because it's worthy of a separate video on its own. The relationship between Sony and Nintendo started when Sony engineer Ken Kutaragi developed the sound chip for the Super Nintendo. After seeing their rival Sega announce the Mega CD, Nintendo knew they had to respond and thought who better to work with than the co-creators of the CD format themselves, who had already done such a good job on their previous project together. Development of this format officially started in 1988 among much speculation in the press. It would start off with Sony developing a CD add-on for the SNES console and then they would begin work on a next generation 32-bit follow-up. Under the terms of the agreement between the two companies, Sony would develop and retain control over the Super Disk format, with Nintendo effectively handing over control of software licensing to Sony. To counter this, Nintendo tried to also negotiate a more favourable contract with Sony's long-term European partners Philips behind Nintendo's back. Of course, this slow manoeuvre angered Sony greatly, and they decided to go off on their own, and I think we all know how that turned out. Nintendo didn't stay with Philips too long either, as after seeing the failure of the Mega CD in the marketplace, they promptly cancelled the SNES CD and the agreement with Philips too, which most famously led to a series of rather infamous Zelda titles being released for the CDI. After the huge success of the Famicom in Japan, Nintendo began to seek out a company to partner with in the West. They were scared of going it alone in North America, especially after watching in horror at the decimation caused by the video game crash in that region. The natural partner was Atari, who they already had a relationship with, having licensed games for them for both the home, market and arcades. They soon entered into negotiations with Atari and their parent company Warner Brothers to release the Famicom as the Atari Advanced Video Gaming System. Nintendo would manufacture the consoles and the cartridges, as well as developing games, with Atari using their own case design and being responsible for both the distribution and marketing. The deal was set to be finalised and signed at the Summer Consumer Electronics Show in June 1983, but Atari had some reservations. Firstly, they were unhappy at the terms offered by Nintendo with regards to the manufacturing restrictions and licensing, 
which left them very little room for profit. This reluctance to sign on the dotted line was exacerbated further by the actions of big US rival Coleco, who were illegally demonstrating its Coleco Adam computer with Nintendo's Donkey Kong game at the show. This was a violation of Atari's exclusive license with Nintendo to publish the game for its own home computers and delayed the finalisation of the contract with Atari. Just a month later, with talks still very much in the balance, Warner fired Atari CEO Ray Kazar and replaced him with James Morgan. He subsequently carried out a full evaluation of all Atari products that were currently in development and saw the 7800 Pro system, which had been developed externally by General Computer Corporation, as a better option due to the backwards compatibility with the 2600 and the increased profit levels it would offer up. Atari would string Nintendo along for as long as possible to delay the release of their potential competition before the Japanese company gave up waiting and decided to go ahead with the NES on their own. Ask any UK gamer who grew up in the late 80s about the Connex Multisystem and just look for the tear in their eye. The Connex Multisystem reached almost legendary status before its incredibly sad demise. It was all people could talk about, in fact. Put together by a team of ex Sinclair engineers, the Flare 1, as it was originally known, was a custom 8-bit console based around the Intel 8080 CPU, which was usually found in PCs. The system was eventually picked up by well-known joystick manufacturer Connex and morphed into the multi-system, but it wasn't always meant to be that way. Development of the console actually started at Sinclair Research as the Loki Project and was dubbed by the press as the Super Spectrum. But when Clive Sinclair sold his computer company to rivals Amstrad in 1985, it left the project up in the air. After taking a long hard look at the Loki, Amstrad decided it wasn't something they wanted to pour more money into, and subsequently cancelled it, leaving the former Sinclair engineers to form Flare Technology and pursue new partners. Under the guidance of Connex, the console would quickly become famous for its range of controller options. Different attachments would allow you to use a flight stick, steering wheel, as well as standard controls, and a fully hydraulic chair was developed to go alongside them for the full experience. But the Connex was not just about gimmicks. It also had some very powerful graphics and sound hardware that rivaled the 16-bit computers of the time. It was also going to operate with discs instead of cartridges, making the games far less costly than its rivals. A host of UK developers leapt to support it including Ocean, Argonaut, System 3, US Gold and Jeff Minter's Llamasoft before the sudden collapse of Connex and the world around them. One day I'll tell the full story in a standalone video as it's an incredibly interesting tale of woe that even points at rival console companies trying to sabotage the system because they were so worried about its release. But I'll save all that for another day and leave you wondering what could have been. Almost unbelievably, none of the original consoles that were produced for press and developers have been found and it's only in the last few years that a dev machine was discovered as well as a source code for several games. Thanks to the work of a dedicated community, you can now emulate the Connex hardware to see exactly what we missed out on all those years ago. I think we all know that the groundbreaking Atari Lynx console was created as the handy game by software house Epix and the designers behind the Commodore Amiga. And we all know that it was eventually picked up and released by Atari. But what's less well known is who it was offered to before the Sunny Velvet based company took the reins. After running out of money, Epix touted their new handy console to all the big companies in the arena, starting with none other than the Big N. Once the first prototype of the handheld was up and running, the team flew over to Japan to do a big presentation in front of their top brass. The story goes that Nintendo's management stayed quiet throughout the whole show, much to the bemusement of Messrs Morse, Needle and Mikal. They then informed the Epic's representatives that they had something to show them, then wheeled out their own prototype in the form of the Game Boy. At this point the handy team knew that it was game over and returned to California. Nintendo were obviously interested in the Lynx, otherwise they wouldn't have given Epix the time of day. After all, it was very unusual for a Japanese company like Nintendo to seek outside influence from a Western company. But whether they were only interested in getting a look at the potential competition is up for debate. Interestingly, Epix subsequently offered the handy to Sega too, who also showed some interest before deciding on developing the cheaper option of a handheld master system instead.
Without doubt, my all-time favorite fact about the best-selling Sega Mega Drive is that the North American version of the system wasn't actually intended to be a Sega console at all. After Sega failed to achieve success with the Master System in North America during the 8-bit generation, they decided to cut ties with their distributor, toy company Tonka, and turn to somebody else instead. Somebody with a background in the video games industry and someone with a proven success in this sector. That somebody was no less than Atari, who pretty much created the whole industry that Sega were now trying to dominate. At the time, Atari Corporation were the number two player in that region behind Nintendo, with both the redesigned Atari 2600 Junior and Atari 7800 Pro system proving to be a big success. Not to mention the strong sales of their new 16-bit Atari ST computer and newly modelled 8-bit XE machines. It was in fact Atari who changed the console's name to Genesis, meaning for a new beginning. Sega actually wanted to call it the Tomahawk after they discovered that the Mega Drive name couldn't be used in North America. The deal fell through when Atari CEO Jack Trammell was refused European distribution, which had already been given to Virgin Mastertronic, as Atari held a big market presence in this region and wanted to capitalise on that. You can't help but wonder how different things could have been with the Genesis badged as an Atari console. If you want to know a bit more about this story, then please follow the on-screen link for an entire video on this very subject. Genesis does. 16-bit arcade graphics. You can't do this on Nintendo. Genesis does. 16-bit sports action. You can't do this on Nintendo. Genesis does. Genesis does. Genesis does. Genesis does. Joe Montana free, Pat Riley free, Buster Douglas free, Super Monaco GP free, or Collins free. What Nintendo buy a 16-bit Genesis system between now and October 31st and get an extra game. And that rounds up my look at five consoles that were very nearly released by rival companies. Are there any others you can think of that should have made this list? How different do you think the history of these consoles would have been if the original agreements went ahead? As always, I'd love to hear your thoughts and views, so get typing in that comments section. Before I go though, I must thank all of my little patrons for continuing to support my channel and make videos like this possible. However, I must give special thanks to the following patrons in particular for their much appreciated pledges. Mitchell Valentino, James Taylor, Neptune, Chaotic, Seth Robinson, Carl Olson, Docs Gamer Man, Tiago Piero dos Santos Silva and Electron Star Collapse. If you also want to help support all my creative endeavours, including this YouTube channel, then please go and check out my Patreon right now. You can get access to host director content, including downloads, exclusive videos, creative insights, and much more besides. I've been the lad. I thank you for watching, and I'll see you all again for another video very soon.